Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this great opportunity you've given me to share God's Word. Even though I will not be able to join you in person, may this be a blessing to all of us. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. It says here, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you will guide us, you will teach us, you will help us understand, teach us your ways, encourage us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we are reminded by this passage, the words that are mentioned here, be steadfast, meaning continue, keep on. It says here, unmovable, be firm, not be shaken. Words here meaning abounding, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Continue doing the ministry, serving Him, loving Him, sharing the gospel. Continue doing that. For as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It always goes back to Jesus Christ. The reason why Christianity exists is because of Christ. He is the author, He is the foundation, the finisher of our faith. And I was talking to a colleague of mine. She doesn't believe in God. And she was making this remark that uh, people in this world um, start or is starting to have that disbelief in religion. And it's true. Even in people who, uh, in people that claim to be Christians, they're starting to lose faith. But we are reminded what is the basis, the standard, what is the, the linchpin, they would say, of Christianity. And if we study this whole passage in 1 Corinthians 15, it is the resurrection. The resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. And it gives us that glimpse and hope and faith and foundation that we too will have that resurrection. The very verse in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14 if our if Christ be not risen then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain but in verse 20 but now Christ is risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept we look forward to that future time that Christ will come back and we know we know that He is truly coming back because of Him coming here in the first place. With the second advent, we know the second advent is true because of the first advent. And that's what I will be sharing today. Um, basically, truths about Christ, uh, five truths of uh, His first coming. The first coming is always connected to the second coming. And the second coming is always connected to the first coming, the first advent. And we can see here, and that's the question. Did he really, did he really came here on earth? It's interesting that they are throughout the scriptures. Uh, at least eight fulfilled prophecies of Jesus Christ. Uh, it would have, the chances of it happening is one in a quadrillion and yet he fulfilled 300 300 more than 300 prophecies of the messiah and we can see on this passage of the first advent in first corinthians 15 and it, our faith starts with this 15 verse 1 brethren i declare to you the gospel which i preach to you which you have received and wherein ye stand by which ye are saved if ye keep into memory, preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Wow. The terms there, according to the Scriptures. There was a purpose there was a reason 
why Jesus Christ died. And I'll be sharing to you again five truths about the first advent that will remind us that the second advent is true. And it all comes back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first I'd like to share to you is the one in the first phrase in verse 3. I delivered them to you that which was uh, that which I also received, how Christ died for, uh, for our sins according to the scriptures. Again, there was a reason. There was a reason why Christ died on the cross. It wasn't a coincidence. He didn't die just because uh, he's a martyr or people are angry at him. Throughout the scriptures, and that's the very terms actually, like the terms proto-gospel, it always depicts of the coming Messiah. And in fact, in Luke 24, when Jesus Christ reminded the, his disciples why he needed to die and why he rose again, in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 47, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. That's very interesting because that would mean all of Torah, all of the uh, the prophets, uh, the Nebi'im, and uh, all the Psalms, the writings, it talks about Jesus Christ. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So basically, if you are studying and reading the Bible and you're not able to connect it with Christ, there's something wrong. If you only think of how to be prosperous or how the, to make the church big, if it's not connected with Christ, you do not understand the scriptures. And it says here in uh, the same passages, and he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved, it needed that Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among the nations beginning at Jerusalem. We can see in this passage, it needed to, to happen. And did it happen? That's the question. It's interesting uh, that even in secular history, atheist historian Gerd Luderman would tell us that the death or the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth is indisputable. Many people tend to think, oh, it, Jesus Christ didn't exist as a person. You have to argue against uh, historians about that because it is well documented that this Jesus Christ really died on the cross and it was an excruciating execution. That's number one. The, exec uh, the excruciating execution of Jesus. He lived and died for our sins according to the scriptures. In fact, if you, you look at Luke 22, 44, it's not just the physical crucifixion that made it painful. In Luke 22, 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. His sweat was as if great drops of blood falling to the ground. You know what that is? That is called hematidrosis. And it is it happens when your body is so stressed and your mind is so stressed. He was stressed. He was ha in mental pain coming in to that crucifixion. Of course, being God, he knows the future pain. He knows the future desertions. He knows the times even though you and I are saved right now, we fail him. And yet, he chose to suffer. He chose to suffer. They say, interestingly, because of what uh, that sweating of blood, that will make the skin sensitive. That every time he was lashed, uh, he was 
scourged it. He felt it intently. Every time he needed to move and breathe at the cross, it was painful to his body. There is that mental stress and that physical pain. That's why the term excruciating out of the cross. That's the meaning of it. Because when somebody is crucified at the cross, it is painful. And he knew about it and he chose to do it for the glory of God, for the salvation of you and me. And it really happened in history. We know of the first coming, him coming on earth. We know of his resurrection because of that excruciating execution that happened in history that even atheist historians would say it did happen. Number two, I'd like to share to you why we believe in Jesus Christ resurrecting and this will help us, challenge us to be steadfast and movable, abounding in the work of the Lord. Number two is because of there were eyewitnesses who saw Jesus Christ alive again. In spite of really being documented and known throughout the time that Jesus Christ really died on the cross, there were eyewitnesses that saw him alive after. We know the resurrection story. The resurrection passages. Mary Magdalene, other women, the apostles. And on this passage, let's go back in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. It says here, 15 verse uh, 5, And that he was seen of Cephas, or Peter, then of the twelve, that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom greater part remain to this present, but some had fallen asleep. There were people who saw him. Again, Peter, the twelve. It's interesting we can see here, it says here James. James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Someone who didn't believe Jesus Christ at that time, but became a believer and wrote the epistle of James became a leader of the church. Why? Because he saw the risen Christ. This should remind us, help us to be strong in our faith, to continue because we know this is true and there were witnesses. Some interesting factor with that, there were witnesses in Jerusalem, the very place, the very place where Jesus Christ died and was reportedly resurrected. People could have said, oh, he's, he's not here. We haven't seen him. People could have shown him the or went to the body. And yet, this emergence of Christianity happened in Jerusalem. This witnesses, and it says here, even in verse 6, seen 500 witnesses, and were alive at the time of writing of 1 Corinthians. So basically, Paul was saying, if you do not believe me, ask them. They saw him. There were witnesses. Interestingly, there are that there is that embarrassment factor. If you look at the Gospels, it was women who found the tomb. In court at this time, women are not allowed to be reliable witnesses. And yet, because that is what happened, that is what they wrote and they testified that happened. There is that persecution fact. They're willing to die for their testimony. If they knew it was a lie, why would you die for a lie? If they knew that they were making it up, it was just a conspiracy, why would you die for it? Why would you suffer for it? Eyewitnesses that saw Jesus Christ and testifies throughout the world that this is true. 
That's why be steadfast and movable, abounding in the work of the Lord. Because the first resurrection is true, then the resurrection for us also is true. The execution, the eyewitnesses, the early accounts. If you read Luke chapter 1 verse 1 to 4, it says here, For as much as he have taken, many have taken in hand to set forth an order of declarations of those things which are most surely believed among us. They believe this, even as they were delivered unto us from the beginning that were eyewitnesses, that were people who saw, and ministers of the word. It seems good for me, this was Luke, for me to also having have perfect understanding, meaning I've studied this, I've learned this, I know about this, of all things from the very first, to write unto you in most order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mayest know the certainty you will be sure and assured wherein thou hast been instructed. An early account of all of this, the Gospels, of the his, uh, historical books, even if you don't believe the Bible, historical books that will tell us of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, they say, if you will take the minimalist approach, you will uh, not use the Bible, but basically all the history, you just base it on history. You can still picture out that there is a Jesus of Nazareth who was considered a prophet, doing good things, doing miracles, supernatural things. He was considered to be the Messiah by some. He died uh, on the cross by Pontius Pilate, by order of Pontius Pilate. And many witnesses... Um, attest that he rose again to the point that the early church believed that he is the son of God. If you only base on extra biblical accounts, you will be able to piece up that narrative. And of course, what we believe a basis of our faith and practice is the Bible. And the gospels are early accounts. It's not legendary. We know Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is a historic person. But the biographies of Alexander the Great, the earliest ones is made or found 400 years. The dating of it is 400 years after his death. And yet it was considered reliable. The early accounts of Jesus Christ was made within his lifetime. 1 Corinthians 15, they already believed that he rose from the dead, and that was about AD 50 to AD 55. Some 20 years after the death of Christ. And interestingly, if you read this passage, it was a the wordings of it, it is like a creed. It is as Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 3, I delivered unto you first which as I received. So he received this before 1 Corinthians was made. And in fact, if you study, it's more on in the Galatians 1.18, there was a time he went after his conversion. He went after three years to Jerusalem to see Peter. And abode with him 15 days. Galatians 1.18 The word interestingly that was used was historio. Or meaning made a historical inquiry. He talked to Peter and asked him what really happened. And this is the basis when this 1 Corinthians 15 was made. Before this talk, it was already there. So if you really trace it back, the belief of Jesus Christ rising from the dead 
was even before to the very point that it was believed the time of the resurrection. Early accounts. Compare Alexander the Great 400 years to 20 years in 1 Corinthians to probably 2 years, 3 years, 4 years in Galatians 1.18. And this was already a creed in Galatians 1.18. So meaning before, the belief in Jesus Christ was pretty much at the time he was resurrected, of course. It really happened. So number one, we have learned of the excruciating execution. The eyewitnesses that saw him early accounts empty tomb matthew 28 12 to 15 to the point again the enemies of jesus christ the jewish leaders the roman uh, government could have just produced the body of christ and people are saying oh he resurrected it's here your, his body is here. And yet in Matthew 28, 12 to 15, they were saying the body was stolen. Interestingly, even they themselves are saying there is no body. They cannot produce a body. Christianity will fall down. Christianity will fail if people can produce the body of Christ. And yet they couldn't. And this will remind us, this will tell us that Jesus Christ really resurrected. And if he resurrected, as the Bible says in verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, And now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. You and I will also be resurrected. Think of your loved ones. I'm sure you miss them. With this COVID pandemic, it really reminds us of the shortness of life and certainty of death. But as the Bible says, the ones who have faith in Jesus Christ will be resurrected too. The whole passage of 1 Corinthians 15 is telling us that. In verse 51, I will show you a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. The ones who had COVID, they will not remain in sleep. But we shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we, we who are alive shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that when this corruptible have put on incorruption, and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. No more pain. No more struggles. No more frustrations of the COVID pandemic. No more frustrations with life itself. Brothers and sisters, Kapamilya, may this remind us to continue because the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened and so is our resurrection. We shall be changed. Christ is coming back soon. This is the basis of this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Why we will continue and we should continue loving God. Because the first advent is true. The second advent is true. Because of that, we know of the first resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know because of his excruciating death. And yet, we see eyewitnesses of him alive. Early accounts written of it. An empty tomb. 
and the emergence of the church. To the point in Acts 17 verse 6, the very term, they turn the world upside down. They have this faith that changed the world because they knew it is true. Right now, there are many people seemingly to lose faith, seemingly discouraged. May the resurrection of Christ and our future resurrection remind us to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the Lord. For as you know that your labor is never, never in vain. In the Lord. The basis of our faith is in the Lord. His resurrection. And a very great record. Consistent record of it happening. God bless you Paul. Good evening. And may this be an encourage for all, encouragement for all of us. Let's pray our Father in heaven. Thank you. Pray Father that you use these words. To remind us to have that fervor, loving you, loving others, to tell them about you. Lord, it happened. It's not just religion. It happened in history. And it is truth. It is reality. May these truths encourage us to serve you more. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Paul.